talk to you about going back to the past to look at the future. And I know today there are a lot of people who say, you know, we got to do this for the future, we got to do that for the future. But I'm going to actually say, listen, the future will take care of itself. Look at the past differently, look at the present differently, and the future will take care of itself by itself. So that's what I'm going to do. But I'm, and I'm going to take you on a step back to the past. But to go on this journey of the past, I need to ask you some embarrassing questions. But don't worry, it's not about that secret kiss that you had in the school, nor is it about that math test that you bunked by sitting at home and watching TV. None of those embarrassing things. All of you studied history textbooks like this, right? Yeah? How many of you remember reading these history textbooks and asking yourself, why is this relevant for me? I'm going to be a software engineer. I'm going to be a management consultant. I'm going to be an engineer or a doctor. Why do I need to know which king died when? Why do I need to know which battle was fought when? Really, why do I need to know all this stuff, right? Not only was it not relevant for me, it just didn't make sense. But just contrast that with what it could have actually been if you were standing over there. I mean, wouldn't it have been an assault on the senses, right? There was something for you to see, there was something for you to hear. Maybe the, the victorious king had a banquet in the evening, so there must have been something for you to taste and drink. There must have been fragrances. Everything would have been there. And yet you're wondering, why is this relevant for me? Not only that, every time in our history textbooks, we were reading about battles, right? And there was violence and blood and all of that. And today, if I take out the paper or switch on the TV, I get more of it. So I'm wondering, really, what's the point of history? I'm learning about stuff that's not relevant. And I'm looking at stuff which is still happening the same. There's still blood and gore on the streets. Really, why is this important at all? Which is why this statement becomes very important. It sure looks like we've ignored history, and we seem to be condemned to repeat it all the time. But never fear. I am there, and I am here to give you a solution that can change the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, the solution is far easier than this dance that all of you guys just did. <laughs> because it just takes a different perspective of the way you look at history. If you want history to be relevant for you, stop looking at it as a series of episodes that have happened over a period of time. If you start looking at it as something where two people with very different needs are fighting over the same thing, it becomes very relevant for you because our needs that we have are universal and they are eternal. You may think that, hey, what do I have in common with Raja Raja Chola? What do I have in common with the guy who's going to go and settle down in Pluto 5,000 years from now? Your needs will be the same. And that's what I'm going to look at. We all as human beings, from the day we are born till the day we die, as human beings from the the earliest Neanderthal man to the guy who's going to go and settle down in Moon how many ever thousands of years later are going to have the same three sets of needs. The need to survive. Food, water, and a shelter over the head. The need for support. I want people to be with me. I want love. I need enrichment in my own life. And the need for security. I need to feel safe. This is my identity. Yes, I am another human being in this room, but I am also different. And these needs do not change. So if we look at history from the point of needs rather than the fr from the point of time, then it becomes something very, very different for us to actually change the way we can look at the future. The source for this is something that I'm going to take, which you can see in little temples like these. And you can also see them in bigger temples like these. But what I'm actually talking about is the writing on the wall. You've heard of this proverb, writing on the wall. It means we often tend to ignore the obvious. I think that quote was right on for this TED talk. It almost looks like it was for this TEDx talk. What it basically means is more than a thousand temples in Tamil Nadu have writing on the walls like this. And this is not a part of your history textbook, so don't go bother and check of them. They're not in the textbooks, and I hope they will be because every one of this writing on the wall has 0% to do anything with uh, mythology or with religion. 
Zero percent, and this is like a big idea that I'm going to push across in this talk. Zero percent have anything to do with gods, with goddesses, with saints, with mythology, none of that. Every letter on the walls of these temples, and there are many of them, are about social, economic, legal, and political decisions that were taken in the community and were put there on stone. If we look at these inscriptions, then our way of looking at history becomes very, very relevant for us in the present and for us in the future. I'm going to take you to this temple. Thiruvottur is not very far off from Madras, not very far off from where we're speaking. And it is, by the way, in a road called the East Coast Road today. Thousand years back, the East Coast Road existed, and it was called Vadaga Peruvari. This was the road that linked the Chola provinces in the south to the Chola provinces in the north. So the East Coast Road that you travel every day, it's a whole lot older than you thought it was. But coming back to Thiruvottur, one of the uh, walls in the Thiruvottur temple has a long inscription like this. And you've got to remember that whatever we expect from the government today is what the temples provided in the old days. How many of you know what the word for temple in Tamil is? Kovil, right? Ko illam. Kon is not a god. Ko is king. So our temples, even the word of it is actually the house of the king, not the house of the god. So every one of these inscriptions are about recordings of whatever the government would want to record. So coming back to our story on Thiruvottur, um, one of the things that we do to the government is to pay taxes. And they did that in the old days, and the temples used to collect taxes on behalf of the king. At one point, and one of the committees that the temple had, which was democratically elected, by the way, was a committee which tested the firmness and the fineness of gold that people deposited as taxes into the coffers. Uh, at some point of time, 1,100 years back, the Chola king had an audit. And when the auditors came to the committee, they found out that what the committee actually had was very different from what they should have had, right? Not very uncommon these days in the papers as well, right? So that's what they found out. And then what they did, we don't know how long it actually took, but it should have taken not more than three to six months. In the three to six months, they seem to have figured out that the temple punvarium or the gold collection committee was a guilty party. They took the private property of the corrupt officials, auctioned it out, took the principal and the interest that they had, they had uh, secreted away, took that money, gave the rest of, them, gave the rest of the money back to, the to that group, and said, here's your money back, leave the community. And not only that, in some similar instances in other temples, we find that those committee members' relatives were debarred from holding offices of public interest in the local community as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Compare this with the speed and the efficiency with how, with how we deal with corrupt officials today. Our second example, is from this beautiful Shiva and Vishnu temple next to each other in Thirumayam. Thirumayam is a small, sleepy village that time's completely forgotten between Madurai and Pudukote. But the two temples have a very interesting inscription because it's the same inscription copied on both the walls of the temple. And in fact, in one temple, the, this inscription actually erases an earlier and far more important and rarer inscription on musical notations. And why was this inscription so important? Around 13th century, or little thereabouts, there were two sects of the same community who were bitterly fighting with each other. I mean, they were like breaking idols, flinging them into the river. There was blood on the streets. Literally, there was blood on the streets. There was massive turmoil in the, in the town. And the Pandya king who was ruling that place just found it too hot to handle. So he called a Hoysala or a Karnataka general to come over. And the general did something very unusual. He split the town into half. He built a wall in the middle. If you had property and water sources here, you were asked to move to that side, and you got the same amount, and vice versa. And he did that. This was on the 7th of May in 1246 of 1249, right? Long time back. Today, though, if you go to this town, none of those communities live there. The lands have changed many, many hands after that. Most of the water sources are not even there anymore, and that wall is not to be seen. It's definitely a temple, a set of a village that time has completely forgotten. 
So what really was the point of building that wall and doing all this partition? Not much. Our third example is one of the most common inscriptions that you find across temples in Tamil Nadu. And our own Kapalishwara temple and, uh, and the Trivilikeni temple also have copies of this kind of an in inscription. So in those days, devotees would come to the temple and they'd say, they'll tell the temple authorities, hey, we want to give some kind of a donation to the temple so that our names are remembered forevermore. And usually they would give a lamp like this, stone lamp like this. A temple will say, thank you very much for this lamp. But listen, because of you giving us this lamp, we're actually going to be spending a lot more money on the oil and the wicks. It doesn't make sense. So the devotee would then come and say, fair point. Um, I want the lamp to burn for two hours a day or 24 by 7, whatever. They would mention that, right? Let's say two hours a day. And then they would say, listen, if the lamp has to burn for two hours a day, this is the amount of ghee or clarified butter that we need to light the lamp. And the devotee would therefore give goats, cows, or buffaloes. And interestingly, it was either 96 goats, 12 cows, or six buffaloes. Why would you, you just need this much of ghee. Why would you give so many animals? Hold on to that, and I'll come back to that. Temple will say, thank you very much for the, for the goats or the cows, but we don't run a dairy, we run a temple. Doesn't make sense, you're putting more work on our plate. So they will then appoint someone else who will take care of these animals on your behalf, and who will give the temple that little quantity of, uh, of ghee to the temple to burn your lamp the number of hours that you want it to burn. Whatever, and this many animals generate a lot of milk and a lot of butter, so the rest of the stuff he could sell, but this he had to give. Now here comes a trick. This man who will look after the devotee's stuff would never be from the same village the temple is in. And this just doesn't make sense. Why would you want this guy to live in another village when transport's not as easy today? I mean, even today it takes me 30 minutes to cross the road sometimes, but it was even worse those days, right? It doesn't make sense. The reason that they did that was if those goat herds or whatever, they kept living in this temple, that village will prosper, not the villages around them. So today in India, we find wealth concentrated in the cities. In 1,000 years back, they thought very differently. They said every action of ours should make me wealthy, but should also make another person wealthy. And every village will be done like this. So you're saying, OK, that's great. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're saying that's great for the, for the goat herd, but what about the rest of the people? The animals had a count as well. The reason that you gave so many animals, because cows that had just been calved could not be milked. Animals which had got older could not be milked. The same animal could not be milked the same, uh, over a continuous period of time. So the welfare of the animal was taken care of, the welfare of the person was taken care of, the need of the devotee was taken care of, the need of the temple was also taken care of. With that one lamp that you gave, there was a whole economy thriving in another village. And here's more to it. Every, ever so often, the temple will do an audit. In the audit, if there are more goats than the devotee gave, that guy can sell it and make money. If there are less goats, he has to reimburse them as well. And this was the kind of system that functioned. So now, coming back and looking at what, how our model works for this, it's often difficult to solve a problem by thinking at the same level. We've got to kind of abstract this to a, to a higher level, and that's where this model comes in very, very useful. Look at history as a series of episodes where two people have been asking for the same thing. In the Thiruvottur temple, it was the auditor, and it was the Punvaryam committee members. They were both after money. In the Thirumayam case, it was the arbitrator, and it was those two warring subsects, and they were both fighting over land, over property, and intangible stuff of identity. In the third case, it was the temple authorities, it was a devotee, and it was about identity, which was in the middle. These are the basic needs that these two people have, to survive, for support, or for security. And every time, it's also about how they start thinking of honoring and meeting these needs. Are they thinking about the short term, which is, my need's important, I don't care about your need. Or are they thinking about the long term, which is your need is important in, find, in helping you find your need, my need will also be met. And that will determine the way that the need is actually met. You either teach somebody a lesson, 
You punish somebody for doing something or you nourish somebody. And every time in history, you can find this in Tamil Nadu, in India, across the world, people and communities who have put the other's need over their need have invariably looked at nourishing the relationship. People who have put their need over the need of the larger community have ended up teaching others a lesson or punishing others a lesson. Short-term success, long-term failure. So that's really the big thought that I want you to go with, that history is relevant. If you look at it as a series of eternal and universal needs that all of us will always have, and we all want to honor these needs, they come in conflict with other people who have different needs, and there we have a choice. We have a choice either to put our need above theirs and think of the short term. We have a choice of putting their need over ours and thinking about the long term. And a phenomenal resource that we have that we just don't use are these lovely detailed temple inscriptions, all of them translated in English, many of them available for free online. Um, I was taught a Sanskrit song in school, and the last line went like this. Vidya dhanam sarvadhana pradhanam Vidya dhanam sarvadhana pradhanam The gift of knowledge is the greatest gift that you can give to others. And this is this little gift that I and people who have helped me have given you. But You have the choice. Tonight when you go to bed, you will turn one page of history in your life. You have the choice tomorrow to wake up and say this TED talk was just another chronological event in your life, or you can say that today onwards, I'm going to look at what my needs are, what the other people's needs are, and how I'm gonna work with it, short term or long term. Thank you very much.